Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Today's video will be about the slave trade and commercial revolution. Learning objectives. Explain the causes for and the development of the slave trade, as well as explain European commercial and agricultural developments and their economic effects from 1450 to 1648. So, earlier video, we talked about the Spanish and the Portuguese and their colonization uh, of the Americas, um, and especially Spain. And uh, they had claimed most of the territory of uh, n both North and South America. And a lot of that was due to the Treaty of Tordesillas, but uh, both France and uh, Great Britain or England at the time largely uh, ignored these claims. And they went on to uh, establish a number of uh, colonies on the eastern seaboard of what is today the uh, United States of America. Uh, the first of which is the lost colony of Roanoke, uh, followed by uh, the establishment of Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. Um, and Without the uh, help of the indigenous Native uh, Americans, uh, most namely the uh, Powhatan, they likely would not have survived. Um, but once uh, tobacco was uh, discovered and um, planted, um, th there was a ready market uh, back in uh, England. And so that led to the... Um, more or less the financial um, reliability of these uh, of these colonies because of course they were looking for material uh, wealth in the in the shape of or mineral wealth in the shape of uh, gold or silver but once uh, tobacco uh, was established as a uh, as a as a crop that was uh, financially viable then uh, there was less of an emphasis on uh, finding gold and silver. Um, at any rate, um, there's a, a mention of indentured servants coming over initially, um, and, and these were people who had their, their journey uh, paid for, uh, and then once they worked for a set number of years, they would be granted their, uh, their freedom and uh, could move around and buy property, which many of them did. Um, when we talk about the 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 later uh, colonies to come, uh, we look at the Northeast and uh, especially um, Plymouth, and then later uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They were established for religious uh, freedom, and that seemed to be the strongest impetus for uh, a large number of Europeans to come over here, and that was for that religious uh, freedom. We'll talk more in the uh, next unit uh, or chapter when we start talking about the Protestant uh, Reformation. We'll talk about, uh, especially in England, how there was a group known as the Puritans and how they uh, desired uh, the free expression of their, of their religious liberties. And for that reason, many of them came uh, to the Americas. And uh, if we look, you can see the 13 colonies, uh, more or less, uh, broken into three groups. You have the uh, New England, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, and then the Southern colonies. And then when we look at the Southern colonies, we notice that, uh, or you should know that their uh, colony or their economies were uh, driven mostly by the, um, the agricultural product of cotton. And as such, slavery was extremely important um, to, their, to their economy. And we'll be talking about that in just a moment. Um, but m first we'll, we'll move to the uh, West Indies or the Caribbean and, and look at how um, that region um, was really the birthplace uh, for slavery, at least here in the Americas and uh, the importance uh, that uh, sugar had with the establishment of that. But before so, before we do that, we'll talk about New France and that of course is Canada um, and some of the um, explorers who were instrumental in, um, in claiming a lot of this territory. Um, so Samuel D. Champlain, Champlain excuse me, was the first to establish the first colony at Quebec, followed by Montreal. Um, 
and there were a, num uh, a number of other explorers who um, explored the Great Lakes area and then, of course, down the Mississippi and then ultimately down to present day New Orleans. And so the area of, um, as you'll see in not just this map, but the next map, uh, the area known as New France uh, covered a, uh, a significant amount of territory. Um, the colony of New France is compared to the 13 colonies. Um, the difference, the main difference is population. Um, many, there were very few uh, French who came to the New World. Uh, so it was very sparsely populated. And the natural resource that they extracted, there was a lot of lumber or timber that was uh, shipped back to uh, Canada or at least uh, in, in either raw uh, timber or in the shape of ships, um, but uh, mostly uh, animal furs and pelts and things like that. Um, so you can see yeah, how much of um, the eastern half of today, present day United States and even the eastern half of Canada was claimed by New France by 1745. So that's going to create a bit of a um, future conflict uh, between uh, France and Great Britain over over who you know who's going to have the right to this uh, territory. So that's going to lead to the French and uh, Indian War or the uh, Seven Years War, which will be talked about later on in this course. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, uh, it's the West Indies that seems to be the area where uh, slavery is first introduced. Um, and that is due to the climate. Um, they two main uh, interests for the economy in this area. There was gold and silver um, mining and then also sugar um, uh, production. And uh, the climate, although sugar is not indigenous to this part of the world, uh, the climate, the tropical climate uh, is exactly what is needed to produce sugar. And so obviously for obvious reasons, they used uh, this area, but they uh, so mistreated the indigenous people that they killed them off, uh, whether it was from the plantations, the sugar plantations, or the terrible uh, working conditions in uh, the um, silver and gold mines. And it wasn't just in the Indies here, but it was all throughout um, the Americas. Well, I mean, South America. Uh, so there was a, a mine here in South America called the Potosi mine uh, that was uh, the largest producer of silver that was uh, shipped back to Spain uh, and made Spain very wealthy. But um, it, it just had disastrous effects on the indigenous population. And so once they killed off so many of the native uh, Mara Indians, uh, they began to look elsewhere for a labor supply. Um, and so that's where West Africa comes into play. And um, there was, uh, so we'll be talking about the slave trade here in just a moment, but I want to make a comment too about just the climate of uh, the Caribbean. And it seems that it's in the, uh, in the uh, tropic zone. And if you look throughout the, uh, the globe um, and you look at, a potential link between slavery and the tropics, uh, one can be found. Um, so some historians think that because of the e extreme temperatures, um, working in the Caribbean is very, very difficult. And so oftentimes uh, groups have compelled others to, to do the work uh, because the you know because the, uh, the the temperatures are just so hot and so humid, um, but at any rate, um, just wanted to mention that. But when we look at the beginnings of the slave trade, uh, want to dispel a few um, incorrect assumptions, and that is that the uh, Europeans came to Africa, enslaved the Africans, and brought them back. Now, they are certainly part of the uh, equation, but slavery existed in the interior of Africa for many centuries. Um, fellow Africans um, were involved in the slave trade, as were uh, Muslims who used them to be exported to parts of the uh, Islamic Caliphate. 
So the slave trade in Africa was well established prior to the arrival of the Europeans. But having said that, um, the Portuguese were the first to establish, as you can rec as you may recall, they were the ones due to uh, Prince Henry the Navigator uh, establishing uh, the the navigation school and funding the the missions or, or down the western coast of Africa. Eventually, they got involved in the slave trade, and I'll mention sort of why in just a moment and this map actually uh sort of tips my hand um once they settled the the canary islands the portuguese and the azores um they found that the uh the climate and the conditions were um were uh, such that sugar plantations would grow or sugar would grow there uh, quite well and so uh, they began uh, using some of the slaves that they purchased uh, on the western coast of Africa to work. And so that's in 1444. So um, that is really sort of the birth of the African slave trade. So it, it was not in the Americas, but it was along the in those Atlantic islands of the Azores and the Canary Islands. Um, so... Uh, this is sort of what I mentioned uh, before. Sugar is a very uh, labor-intensive crop, and also because the climactic conditions are so warm, um, you know, it 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 stands to reason that slavery, as as morally repugnant as we see it uh, in through the lens of uh, 21st century eyes, um, you know, during that time period, it was seen as uh, acceptable. Okay. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the slave trade, uh, in Western Africa and, and Europe began in uh, the mid 1400s. Uh, we start to see, uh, the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade begin in 1518. Um, but it's worth noting, um, that for the first 100 years, all of the slave trade was uh, sort of concentrated in two areas. It's going to be here in Brazil, which was claimed uh, by Portugal, and then here in the West Indies. And at that time, that was all under uh, Spanish control. So we're not going to see any um, slave trade to North America until 100 years later, starting in 16. Uh, 19 okay um, so when we look at a, like a breakdown of the statistics um, about 12 million throughout the entire history of the slave trade 16th through 19th century we're looking at 12 million total slave 12 million slaves being brought here uh, to the western hemisphere so that's both north and South American, I think what uh, most people found, find interesting is that um, there's relatively small numbers coming to North America. The, um, the concentrated, you know, the vast majority uh, either go to the West Indies or to um, what is today uh, Brazil. So uh, of the uh, 12 million, only a couple of million come to uh, North America. And that's to primarily the uh, thir of the 13 colonies to those southern colonies, those that uh, grew cotton and uh, tobacco mostly. Uh, and that leads to this uh, creation of a sort of uh, interconnected economy between uh, Europe, Africa, and the new world um, and that's known as the uh, triangular trade system and um, there are multiple um, sort of ways in which this trade uh, took place but when we talk about Africa and those goods that emanate from Africa and I say goods but I mean you know people um, the slaves were pretty much the only thing that was exported. Might have been some uh, some gold uh, because in that part of Africa there um, is a good deal of gold uh, that existed, and so there might have been some gold trade coming out of Africa. 
but the vast, vast majority of the trade that came out was uh, in, the, in the shape of slaves, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and so their destination, again, it, it really was one of three places, either North America, the West Indies, or in South America, most uh, specifically uh, Brazil. But uh, between those points, they might have traded back and forth. So North America and the West Indies might have conducted their own uh, form of trade. It didn't necessarily have to go just to one destination and back to, uh, to Europe. Um, there were there were multiple legs uh, to this uh, triangular trade, so it's a little bit more complex than what this graphic um, sort of lets on. I think this graphic or this map here shows the more complicated uh, nature or complex nature of the slave trade and um, the variety of goods that are going back and forth between uh, the Americas and the Euro Europeans that may not necessarily include even Africa. All right. Um, but anyway, that's the uh, triangular trade system. Um, when we talk about the middle leg, the, the passageway from uh, Africa to the Americas, that's known as the middle passage. And again, as I mentioned, the vast, vast majority of that was uh, the slave trade. Um, and we can really see here just the uh, absolutely uh, inhumane conditions in which these uh, these poor slaves had to travel in. You can see how they are treated like a commodity. Um, the, uh, the conditions were very overcrowded as this um, uh, graphic or this illustration suggests. Um, and one of the biggest concerns in my mind and what I've read about the topic was the lack of fresh air. Uh, they say the overall mortality rate for the um, journey over was uh, just at about 10%. I'm surprised it wasn't uh, a great deal higher because of these conditions. There was no consideration given to uh, the personal hygiene or any kind of sanitation. So disease was uh, a problem as was the uh, incredible or just, you know, the unbearable uh, stench because there were no sanitation facilities aboard these ships. So again, it's a surprise uh, that the um, mortality rate wasn't higher than just uh, the 10 percent all right so that wraps up uh, this discussion with uh, the slave trade uh, want to move on or move to uh, economics and how through this mm, I mean I don't want to I mean it, it, it's in a way global trade um, certainly 16th century uh, it was considered global trade, uh, but, you know, it's it's between three different continents, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Um, some new phenomena are going to be uh, taking place. As we move forward in this course, we're going to be talking a lot about um, capitalism, and uh, we're, we're progressing towards that. We're not yet, uh, we, we are certainly into uh, the time of what would be classified as like pre- um, capitalistic economies um, but really it's going to give rise to something called uh, mercantilism which I'll talk about in a in a moment uh, the first phenomena that uh, happens as a result of uh, in part the trade international trade that's taking place is uh, the price revolution and simply put the price revolution is an economic phenomenon known as inflation uh, it had never been experienced before uh, throughout the hundreds of years prior uh, when Europe was for the most part just an agricultural feudal uh, system uh, the the wages uh, as as along with prices remained relatively stable uh, that is of course until the Black Death which led uh, wages to increase and then um, prices for commercial goods or uh, consumer goods rather dropped and that was um, a reflection of supply and demand so starting in the 16th century uh, we start to see prices go up now it's sort of the reality today that inflation is among us um, but for the most part um, for the greater part of even my life 
uh, inflation is is nominal. It's two to three percent, as and then and that's what it was for the most part during the 16th century. But that was something that was never experienced before, so um, it it was problematic for for countries. And there were certainly times when it was even higher than the two to three percent, and that resulted in some uh, pretty uh, drastic uh, impacts. And we'll we'll get through that. Um, but what I want to talk about is kind of where that comes from. Like what was the cause of the price revolution in Europe? And for a long period of time, uh, economic historians thought that it was primarily just, um, because of all the gold and the silver that was coming to Europe, mainly Spain, from those American mines, that that created the inflation uh, that takes place, and that would be because um, there was, you know, this drastic injection of uh, uh, gold bullion or silver bullion uh, into the um, money supply that had devalued the currency. Uh, that certainly is a part of it. Um, they used to think that that was the primary driver of the inflation. But now, um, after looking at uh, demographics, they've seen that over the 16th century, that the population rose about a total of 30%. And so what that's going to do is that's going to create, um, and, and before I say anything else, it's primarily due to the Colombian exchange um, because of the, the different types of foods. So the diets of the Europeans um, becoming more nutritious, more diverse, and more healthy. And so they're living uh, longer and, and fewer people are dying uh, are, of starvation uh, because the, uh, the, the, it, it's not entirely broken, but uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer instances of outbreaks of famine. At any rate, uh, this 30% rise in uh, the European population over a century is going to create a demand for consumer goods. And that demand is going to cause uh, prices to go up. So um, that's the, the, the second and, you know, equally important reason for why there is inflation. At any rate, um, the, the, the effects... Uh, are varied um, for workers like commoners, uh, whether you're, you know, working for a guild or uh, as a farmhand or as a peasant, your wages would remain flat. So as prices went up for consumer goods, um, wages for the most part did not keep pace. All right. So for most people, it, it, it weakened or it made worse uh, their standard of living. Uh, for those that were landowners, um, they they could uh, expect uh, more income because as you know, costs for consumer items, food would be included in that, and so their way uh, th their uh, their incomes would would rise. Uh, and then for larger business owners, they could you know, raise prices and then pass those on to the consumers. And so they benefited. So it was only the act, you know, the elites, the wealthy that benefited from, um, this, uh, economic phenomena. Okay. Uh, and then the last topic that, uh, I'll be discussing this evening in this video is mercantilism. Okay. And so this is really the economic system that, um, is a predate or a precursor to capitalism. All right, and it says it's an economic system where starting in the 17th century, countries aimed at uh, increasing the power of the state and, and they attempted to uh, create conditions that really favored their country's economy uh, so that it would be, in, in the end, more powerful than its neighbors, okay? And I guess, and, and I'm going to go through all of this uh, like point by point, but the one thing that I want to make sure that we understand that's 
fundamental to all of this, uh, was this belief that the wealth of the world uh, was finite, meaning there was a fixed amount. And that the only way for a country to become more wealthy and therefore more powerful was if another country became less wealthy and less powerful. So since the, the amount of wealth that existed um, in the world, again, was finite or limited, the only way they can gain wealth is if other countries lost it. Uh, and so since that was the um, kind of the overarching belief system within mercantilism, uh, we start to see governments within these countries um, play a very active role in their country's economy. When we evolve uh, in the next century to the system of capitalism, um, it, it sort of reverses itself where um, countries, governments begin to take a hands-off approach or a laissez-faire approach to their country's economy. But during the 16th, uh, or excuse me, in the 17th century, we start to see, we see mercantilism. And so what is that? Um, so in what way would a country um, take an active role in its economy? Well, first and foremost, they wanna do as much as they can to increase the amount of gold bullion that they have in their treasury. Uh, and so the way in which that was done was through trade. Uh, and what a country attempted to do was export as much uh, finished manufactured goods as possible and import the least amount of manufactured or finished goods as possible. Um, so what would they take in, in exchange for their exports? Well, gold. Or silver uh, and that was all intentional so that they could fill the Treasury because that was sort of the truest um, indicator of wealth and therefore power okay and so anything that they could do to fill their treasuries full of gold and silver that was the goal um, another um, and, and this uh, graphic shows this another way to achieve that was through the uh, the establishment of colonies. So a colony could provide the mother country with the necessary raw materials so that they in turn could manufacture them and then hopefully sell them back to the colonists and again increasing uh, their their wealth. Um, there's some other things that they did as well. Um, countries or governments subsidized various industries they allowed monopolies uh to t uh, to exist i mean essentially the crown would pick a company that they wanted to be responsible for manufacturing a certain good um and so they would pick winners and losers and they would also uh, help subsidize various industries uh, to help get them off the ground and what i mean by subsidize a subsidy is is uh, financial assistance. So that could be in the shape of uh, loans uh, or grants. Um, and so what the government is trying to do is help a, a specific industry get get off the ground. For example, like shipbuilding, uh, so that they could do a better job of transporting, you know, their goods uh, to other countries. Um, and another thing that they might do is implement tariffs, okay? A tariff is going to be a tax on imported goods. And the reason why they would do that is they would want to discourage people, their own citizens, from purchasing imports because, you know, that tariff would make that import more expensive than some domestically produced uh, product. And then probably the final way that a, a, a state could help be more or less a cheerleader for its economy in the system of mercantilism is by building roads so like infrastructure public works projects so that you know these businesses can do a better job of getting access to raw materials and you know manufacturing them their goods and then eventually shipping them uh, 
um, you know, or, or getting them to the coast so that they could be shipped to other countries. So roads, bridges, and canals would be another um, way in which a, a state uh, could could help um, um, subsidize or, or just favor various uh, industries within their country. All right. Um, and then the last thing, the last economic term that we're going to mention here is the, the, the creation of the joint stock companies. Now, earlier in this uh, section 2.3, we talked about how Portugal and Spain were the first two countries to um, uh, uh, get involved in overseas exploration. And that was because uh, they had uh, a, a more or less, you know, uh, consolidated crown. And so they had the, the, the money, they had the, the resources and the bureaucracies necessary for such an inexpensive endeavor. Uh, that begins to change um, in the uh, 1600s, and that is due to the creation of the joint stock companies. And what that does, or what that is, is a way to pool um, money, uh, a way to generate financial resources from a, a, a you know, a broad section of a country's um, population. And it would be viewed as like an investment um, because over, over, overseas trade had great returns. And so because the startup costs were very high, you know, and maintaining a fleet and, the, you know, the, all the expenses associated with it, uh, it was very difficult for just a small group of people to have the money, you know, on hand to be able to uh, finance such a expensive endeavor. And so they pooled their resources and that was the creation of the joint, the joint stock company. And the benefit of that for obvious reasons, obviously it makes it less expensive. The, the costs are shared uh, by many as opposed to a few. Uh, the risks um, are such that you know, you, you might lose your investment, but you're not directly responsible um, for the losses of the entire company. So, you know, although there were risks, they were sort of mitigated or lessened because of this uh, setup. Um, and then the other thing is it, it, it really helped hasten the establishment of uh, capitalism. Because as I mentioned a, a moment ago, capitalism was this uh, economic system where there was no governmental uh, involvement. It was a hands-off approach, a laissez-faire approach, and it was the joint stock companies that really made that possible because they no longer needed the help or nor the assistance of their governments. They could do it on their own. And so that's really what's going to make the transition from a mercantilistic economy to a capitalistic economy uh, possible. And that's all for today. Thanks uh, for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe and hit like. I don't know. Thanks a lot.